Thank you for coming. We are very happy to um, share some considerations about um, maybe alternative ways on reflection in teacher education. Um, I start reading now. <laughs> um, in this courses on pedagogical professionalization, the term reflection is omnipresent. Even though this term has a large range of different meanings in diverse argumentative contexts, it is interesting to note that it usually promises to make teachers adopt a distant stand towards their practice. This distance corresponds to a certain ideal of a scientist's perspective from which it is possible to objectively question assumptions that provide fun a functioning right reality. It is permeated by an idea of objectivity as it is prominent in natural science. The scientist, so to say, does not share the world of the practitioner. Reflection, therefore, becomes a means of disengaging with reality. This dominant ideal of reflection, as it shows in the discourse on teacher education, is tied to a representationalist understanding of research. A problem we will hint to is that this ideal is insensitive to the object of reflection in pedagogical practice contexts, that is, pedagogical experiences. Pedagogical experiences cannot be done justice in their contingent and ambiguous character via objectification. One could now argue that the parallel of reflection and research is problematic altogether, or, and that is what we try to outline, one could take this discrepancy as an impulse to look for different concepts of research with a different relation between researcher and research to remodel the term of reflection. In order to do so, we look at phenomenological and new materialist perspectives on research and rep respective modes of reflection that allow different relations to reality. In the following, we first reconstruct the dominant ideal of reflection in the discourse on teacher education. Secondly, we contrast phenomenological perspectives to that dominant ideal and examine the way research and researched are related in, cons in a constitutive difference. Drawing on new materialist perspectives, we thirdly outline an alternative way of modeling reflection in which the reflected is only constituted by the encounter between researcher and researched. That refers to a way of doing research that does not assume an outside perspective on the phenomenon but becomes a part of its constitution. In conclusion, we ask to what extent leaving behind the dominant ideal with phenomenology and new materialism could provide ethical impulses for the term reflection in the discourse on teacher education. Okay, I now continue and try to map out the problem we start from a little further by looking at the ideal of reflection in the discourse on teacher education. In the German discourse on teacher education, reflection is a key concept, marking a common ground of what is regarded as pedagogical professionality. Rather than just acting by impulse or in accordance with conventions, pedagogical professionals are supposed to rationally thank you, decide on an appropriate course of action on the basis of arguments. Professional pedagogical practice is supposed to be more than mere routines that can be picked up by participating in school practices. Practice without reflection is considered as conservative and unable to question its own adequacy. Reflection therefore becomes the breaking point with an unquestioned immersion into practice routines. It promises a privileged epistemic standpoint with access to scientific knowledge enriching the reflecting subject's perspective in a way that it can transcend the practitioner's point of view. This ideal of reflection is based on the concepts of distance and objectivity. In this context, the term reflection is connected to the claim of cutting all ties to the reflecting subject's life-world reality.
This type of reflection goes along with an unattached observer's position. Professionalization is then closely connected to the idea of being able to relate oneself to one's own practice from a scientist's perspective that is removed from conventions and norms. This debunking mode of reflection claims to see the phenomenon in question for what it really is, as undistorted as possible. Therefore, reflection is understood as a device for disclosing reality. This dominant ideal of reflection is closely connected to an ideal of research in which the researcher becomes a, nat a neutral observer with no lively connection to, re to the observed. An objectivist understanding of empirical research, as it is rooted in natural sciences, leaves little room for a personal relation between researcher and researched. Even in qualitative research designs that follow a reconstructivist claim, a hidden representationalism can be found. In teacher education, this ideal of research is actualized in formats of inquiry-based learning in which students, student teachers carry out research projects at school. The perspective of a, of a scientist the students are supposed to adopt is meant to promote reflexivity in the sense of a critical scrutiny of practice. The function of research mirrored in these arguments is to disclose the probably deficient school realities that are to be criticized and improved by scientific knowledge. In order to do so, students are introduced to methods in which a representationalist concept of research is traceable. Disturbing variables are to be controlled. Research is supposed to come as close as possible to something that is out there, that is reality understood as a given object. As plausible as it is that teachers should be able to look critically at well-established conventions and routines, it is also important to ask whether a supposedly neutral standpoint of the reflecting subject goes along with problematic implications. We would like to point to two of the latter. Firstly, modeling the reflecting subject as an unattached observer can foster an indifferent attitude toward, towards pedagogical practice. If pedagogical experiences are only constituted by involved actors, an unattached observer might not be able to access pedagogical qualities of a situation altogether. The observer becomes unresponsive and therefore unable to answer to situational claims in pedagogical interaction. This is especially problematic since an ethical idea of pedagogical professionality is to be able to react to singular situations and unforeseeable encounters with others that cannot be dealt with adequately by applying knowledge. Answering to the pedagogical addressees in a particular situation presupposes an involved and responsive subject. Secondly, reflection becomes only a tool for identifying what is there. A feeling for what could have been is impossible for an observer. In contrast, Approaches that pluralize the realities of what is being researched and thus open up for new possibilities for dealing with them could be fruitful for an emancipatory mode of reflection. Yes, I now take over again. We switch a little more often. Um, and I come to, um, we come to um, a phenomenologist counterposition on that ideal of um, reflection in teacher education. The first problem of becoming unresponsive and unanswerable could be addressed by a phenomenological concept of reflection. Phenomenology offers a critical stand towards a Cartesian tradition by challenging the idea of a disembodied and isolated subject as the center of one's being in and to the world. An objective of phenomenological reflection is an analytical approach to the way things are experienced as something particular. This difference between something and its ex being ex experienced as something particular makes identifying the phenomenon impossible. Reflection therefore cannot guarantee direct access to the phenomenon in question but addresses the conditions of the encounter between the subject and the phenomenon. Phenomenological research methods 
oppose representationalists, uh, representationalism by starting from a subjective experience within the world that refers to the being in the world of the researcher and the researched. To understand how phenomenology makes it possible to understand reflection differently, we first need to ask how the relationship between the researcher and the researched is understood regarding what is assumed to be a phenomenon. The concept of the phenomenon is understood differentially in terms of the systematic distinction between the intentional operations of observing and what shows itself in the world. Waldenfels grasps this distinction with the term significative difference. It assumes that the phenomenon appears as something in contemplation. It shows itself and must be answered to in order to see it. In its focus on experience as a leading principle on research, phenomenology recurs to a process of making and articulating meaning. For the question of how phenomenology relates to phenomena in its it is now crucial that something always remains unavailable about them regarding the significative difference since something eludes in the attempt of verbal expressions of what is experienced. Thus, there is no universal meaning of phenomena and no method of grasping what is assumed to be the, rea the reality. Rather, the meaning of phenomena is always sought of in dependence on and equally in withdrawal from the researcher's perspective. This points towards a mode of research in which knowledge generating practices are constantly reflected. In this respect, phenomenological research assumes the correlative relationship between the concrete mode of perception and the appearance of a thing. Phenomenological research practices can subsequently be understood as orientated towards the reality of experience. From there, the phenomenological mode of research acknowledges the difference of the understanding, perception and operations of knowledge production in the principle of the epoche. This leads to a controlled dismantling of everyday schemes and theoretical pre-understandings in the practice of reduction and, subsequently, to gaining and pluralizing meaning through the practices of description and variation. Bearing this in mind, how can the phenomenological perspective on reality be characterized? We tend to call the phenomenological type of research as one that is realistic in that way that through experience it bodily and effectively relates to phenomena. However, it does not claim to gain knowledge about the essence of phenomena or the world. Rather, phenomenology considers the productive power of epistemological practices and leads them to a methodological control regarding the difference between the operations, operations of researching and phenomena showing themselves. In that difference, the researcher is effectively attached to the phenomenon, situated in the same sphere of reality, he or she, ho however, assumes a genuine position of a researcher that is established through reflection on this attachment. Okay, I now try to outline what these epistemological ideas could maybe um, hold as a potential for a phenomenologically inspired term of reflection. When it comes to a phenomenolo phenomenological idea, um, <laughs> um, of reflection. It is interesting to consider to what extent the phenomenologist is considered capable of exerting control by stripping off layers of the phenomenon that constitute its meaning. One could argue that the reflecting subject is, to a certain degree, able to suspend its relations to reality by reducing its own experience. This reduction, in a sense of giving room to a moment of not yet knowing, can also be interpreted as a way of reconnecting to reality beyond a mode of identification. Especially in the variation, phenomenology sheds light on the plethora of qualities in which a phenomenon can be experienced. Therefore, distancing oneself from a seemingly unchangeable reality does not offer access to a static reality behind the everyday world, 
but stresses how realities are constituted by certain, maybe habitualized, ways of encountering things. The analytical focus on this encounter may loosen fostered everyday interpretations and open up for new ways of being with the phenomenon. So, our being in the world is not eliminated or frozen by reflection. Indeed, phenomenology would claim that reflection becomes only possible because there is something that can constitutively not be known and controlled. So, reflection is an ongoing investigation with something that stays opaque. Reflection stays something corporeal and situated. The feeling body is also, also the felt body. And in becoming felt, it becomes something to which the subject can relate to. The relation to the world itself can become the object of reflection as a vivid and fragile way of relating to being related. The ongoing bind between reflecting subject and its history prevents a sovereign reflection. No reflection could eliminate our being already in the world, being already cold and being already held. But that does not mean that reflection becomes impossible altogether. If reflection itself describes a mode of relating to the world in an engaged way, only something that is not entirely graspable and obvious becomes a fruitful object of reflection. Reflection, in this sense, becomes a term that deals with a difference as a relation that calls for something. A phenomenologist approach to reflection could point to this relation indifference as non-indifference. Reflection neither enables the subject to break with its own being situated in the world, nor does it eliminate the difference between the immediacy of the here and now and the way of experiencing it. The idea of distancing oneself from assumption about a certain phenomenon can be read as an attempt at allowing for more closeness to a phenomenon. Not only in habitualized everyday interpretation of the things we supposedly know, but also a scientific being to the world is to be reduced. By doing so, the researcher can become responsive to affecting qualities of the phenomenon that might be overshadowed by a certain rationale. A researcher who eliminates everything that affects him or her will have the phenomenon slip away under his fingers. Phenomenology does not eliminate or deny the surplus of a phenomenon that is always ambivalent and multifaceted. Yes, I come now to um, yeah, maybe a different way of uh, understanding reflection with new materialist assumptions. Um, methodological assumptions at first and from there I will outline some uh, ideas about reflection in that. With reference to new materialist methodologies we turn away from what is meant by the notion of reflection originally and shift how it could possibly be grasped. In doing so we address the second problem of affirming and identifying reality as something fixed and unchangeable. This means that we do not understand research and knowledge practices as something removed from reality. Yes. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> um, as something removed from reality. In that sense, new materialism shares the phenomenological criticism towards the representationalist research approaches. Beyond that, however, new materialism makes it possible not only to observe phenomena from an outside perspective, but also to focus on their inherent other possibilities by considering oneself and one's own knowledge practices as part of the phenomenon. As a consequence, we do not want to sketch reflection in terms of a mode of distancing, but in terms of a mode of being entangled with the phenomenon observed. To understand that shift, we first point out the cause set by new materialist ways of addressing phenomena within the becoming of the world. Second, in reference to Haraway and Barat, we turn to diffraction as a way of doing research that implies a criticism on reflection as situated in representationalism. In doing so, we do not aim at leaving the notion of reflection behind. However, drawing on the new materialist criticism that comes with the term diffraction, 
we want to reorient what reflection means regarding the possibility of considering epistemological practices as part of, and not as perspective on, the emergence of observed phenomena. Reflection is then seen as a way of reconnecting to other possibilities of becoming within the realities of phenomena. Before we come to reflection and the project of understanding it in discussion with the notion of diffraction, there's another shift that can be assumed as a starting point of new materialist research programs. This shift regards the question of what is understood to be a phenomenon that can become of interest in research. Here, the phenomenological assumption is turned around that phenomena arise from a difference between the operations of observation and the observed in which researcher and researched occupy opposing positions. Rather, phenomena are seen as relations without preceding relater. They emerge through their intra-activity, which considers not only the observed, but also the operations of observing and the perspectives that arise from them as a part of the phenomenon. It all refers to an entanglement of the researcher's situatedness in a field, the data, the methodologies, and the observed. In this process of entanglement, the phenomenon and the entities within the phenomenon situationally become specific through agential cuts. According to Barat, these agential cuts are discursive and material practices through which boundaries are enacted. They make differences and thus constitute meaning. The notion of agential cuts captures that in the performative constitution of a phenomenon, things are cut together apart as one movement. In this regard, an agential cut is to be understood as a movement in which boundaries are procedurally realized and entities become specific in relation to each other. In that lies a difference to phenomenology that points to a specific attitude towards how research can be done. Whereas in phenomenology, the subjective experience in its difference to the observed is assumed to be the starting point of research, for new materialism, differences are only to be understood in terms of powerful realizations of boundaries. The, the positions of the researcher and the researched are performatively enacted through agential cuts become specific in relation to each other and lose their significance again in the process of the becoming of the world. From there, it becomes clear that new materialist research is not about identifying something that is assumed to be real, but rather about entanglements and the effects of differentiations emerging in them that makes something become real. It raises the question of the inner workings of power within a phenomenon by asking how practices and discourses draw boundaries that matter in the sense that they produce and exclude certain meanings of the world. The new materials method of diffraction offers to explore these realizations of boundaries as overlapping differentiations within which entangled phenomena situationally become specific. Through diffraction, reality is not assumed to be aesthetic and essential. Rather, it points to the fluidity, uncertainty, and also variability of realities within the becoming of the world. Barat marks reflection now um, as a common metaphor for thinking that is situated in the th sphere of representationalism. She develops her core concept of diffraction as a counterterm. While reflection is linked to a representationalist logic of research and thus characterized as something as little intrusive as possible, it is constitutive to any process of diffraction to be an intervention by considering the apparatus of observing phenomena as included in phenomena. We, could, we would like to argue that this dichotomy can be softened when remodeling the lack of involvement in the term of reflection um, that is uh, associated with the term of reflection. 
To do that, it is important to consider a distinction Barat draws towards the term of diffraction. For her, it is either addressing diffracted phenomena in research or researching diffractively, not both at the same time. To soften the dichotomy between reflection and diffraction, this distinction is crucial because it points towards the mode of research in which reflection can become a productive and in that regard ethical term. When referring to diffraction as a method of research that is directed towards the emergence of something new, reflection as a representationalist term for distancing from one's own research practices becomes excluded. Here, a diffractive way of doing research aims at producing entanglements and thus a variety of becomings by, uh, uh, um, by reading theories into one another or by plugging in theory into data into theory. Through this, different meanings arise within the entanglements um, that, is, uh, that lie in the process of research. In contrast to that, when addressing diffractive phenomena as the object of research, the shifting of the notion of reflection as returning by the means of Barat opens possibilities of relating to entanglements in phenomena in a productive way. Now, how can the shift uh, in the significance and therefore in the use of reflection be understood regarding research practices addressing diff diffractive patterns in phenomena? Where phenomenology understands reflection as a process of relating to relations in new materialism, it is a process of returning to differentiations within relations. Returning does not conceive of reflection as a mode of examining one's own research practice in order to see the phenomenon in question more accurately. Rather, it is productive in that sense that it turns back to the power permeated conditions of generating knowledge. In doing so, research practices become part of the observed phenomenon as another possibility of reality which emerges in reflection. Reflection as returning to the conditions of one's own research practices is, uh, is able to understand these as boundary reala realizations in which the observed becomes another phenomenon. In this sense, reflection leads to further entanglements and thus multiplies the possibilities of the becoming of the phenomenon. A new materialist account on reflection thus refers not to one reality, but becomes productive by highlighting the different realities as possibilities of becoming within relating to phenomena in research. This productive dimension of reflection is of ethical value as it hints to the plurality of possibilities inherent in contingent realities. Okay, we now come to a close and try to formulate an outlook by looking at the ethical potentials of remodeling reflection um, in research and research and teacher education. We think that remodeling reflection in accordance with research paradigms that deviate from a natural scientist ideal of objectivity might be promising for the discourse on teacher education. With regard to the first problem of an indifferent reflecting subject, we consider a phenomenological understanding of reflection helpful as it permits a non-indifferent relation of the reflecting subject and pedagogical experiences as the object of reflection. Taking qualities of experiences into account that make the subject answerable for situative claims could be of ethical relevance when considering pedagogical practice as something fragile and contingent that calls for a responsive subject. Reflection within effective relations can draw attention to what is at stake and what the subject is answerable for. Answering to the second problem of objectifying reality, we consider a new materialist notion of reflection ethically relevant for taking the possibility of other realities into account. Reflection in this sense is not a separation from reality, but a way of returning to it 
that is, a mode of addressing one's own being productively entangled in powerful relations and thereby opening up the possibility of new entanglements. As the discourse on teacher education asks for modes of reflection in which something other than the already established becomes thinkable, this sensitivity to readdress the productive moment of reflection could also be of ethical importance. Looking at the way of being related to the world without claiming to disrupt or freeze these relations for us adequately describes research as a mode of engaging with reality by focusing on, ins on one's own being engaged with reality. Phenomenology and new materialism both offer different ways to shape this engagement. The shared deviance from a representationalist model of research and respectively of reflection does not go along with arbitrariness. The researcher's engagement with the object in, questions, in question brings about commitment. Being responsive to these committing dimensions is something phenomenology can highlight. Being a productive part of their emergence comes into view when taking on a new materialist perspective. Thank you very much.